I've never bought art as an investment, although I did buy it as a business. Shortly after starting residency and buying my first house, I became enamored with the art at a local gallery in an attempt to fill my walls. But it was too darn expensive on a resident salary. After much searching, I eventually found vendors selling the same artwork, but much cheaper on eBay. The long and the short of the story was that I discovered a vibrant secondary art market, ingratiated myself to a few key players, and eventually went into business on my own. I sold a few hundred thousand dollars of artwork in a year or two, but didn't make a lot of money. Eventually, I got too busy when I started my own medical practice and had to give up on the art. In a sense, I was practicing price arbitrage. I knew what people liked and would sell quickly. But as a long-term investment, I was clueless. In fact, when it comes to art, most of us are. Maria Brito is an award-winning New York-based contemporary art advisor, entrepreneur, author, and curator. She has 13 years of experience as an art advisor after leaving her career as a corporate attorney in a big law firm in New York City. She was selected... She was selected by Complex Magazine as one of the 20 power players in the art world, and in 2020, she was named the Art News. And in 2020, she was named by Art News as one of the visionaries who gets to shape the art world. Maria Brito, welcome to Earn and Invest. I have to ask this question, and I apologize, but I'm going to start by asking you what hangs on your walls. <laughs> Hi, Doc. Thank you so much. I do have about, I'd say, 50 artworks in my apartment in New York. And um, I have a mix of established artists, mid-career and emerging. So that's, you know, blue chip, if we are to compare it with stock, right? It's like blue chip. Then the companies that are doing okay, but are still sort of like having struggles and things like that. And then you have your freaking crazy fun startups, right? That it's a gamble, but it usually brings the highest rate of return because you didn't have to spend the same amount of money to buy your established blue chip or your mid-career. So I have been collecting longer than I have been in the business. And it was one of the reasons why I actually quit my career as an attorney, not only because I hated being an attorney and it was really not for me, and I'm sorry to the attorneys who are listening. I don't have anything against you guys. I love you, but somebody's got to do that job, not me. And um, I started collecting because I moved to New York in 2000. And this continues to be the center of the art world in terms of the amount of galleries, auction houses, and uh, museums, and how things happen in New York. And so by being in the city, I had access to all this young galleries and I became very infatuated too with the idea of having great things on my walls but it had to be it had to be profound it just it didn't have to be the guy who's in like outside you know MoMA or the Met like with his things just there on the street it had to be an artist who had a gallery representation an artist who could explain where the things were coming from or somebody could explain me what was the depth of it and that is really what contemporary art and actually any art because artists have been the greatest pioneers of ideas in history and there are always things that they are trying to tell us there are always secrets that are always incredible ideas and connections actions that they put together in their work that teach, educate, help you see things from a different perspective, bring enlightenment or fun or energy or a particular moment in time. So I wanted to be culturally integrated into this. And so that's how I started buying art for myself. And I started recommending friends. And when I started recommending friends very informally, because I still was an attorney at a big law firm, my friends would, and this was obviously pre-Instagram, pre all that, you know, and it was a very opaque world. The, the art, it's not that it's very crystalline right now, but it was a lot harder to have any idea of what was going on so I started recommending to friends and friends started buying and then they would call me you know two years later and say you know that painting or that thing that I bought because you told me just doubled in value because we have been tracking results at auction or 
you know, we saw that the artist you recommended us got a solo show at LACMA in Los Angeles. You have such a good eye. And so that was uh, a little validation that I needed for myself so that I could take a step forward, leave a career I hated and started doing this professionally. And that was how this started. Now, I it was ask... a long answer. <laughs> it was a long answer about what I have hanging on my walls. I have to ask this question. One thing I noticed, because in a sense, when I got into my mini art business, I started because of love of the artwork. But as I did it for quite a while, it changed the way I felt about art, specifically after buying and selling hundreds of thousands of dollars of paintings. On some level, the paintings became pieces of paper and inventory, as opposed to this thing that I was enamored by did it change how you felt about the artwork as it became your business no because i don't hold on to inventory so i am an advisor and uh if like the only way i would hold on to inventory is if i would be selling my own things which i have sometimes but i normally don't or if i were to be taking a lot of even when i do secondary market deals i don't really take on inventory so for me those hurdles and constraints don't exist because I am a I'm an independent advisor, in other words. Like I can work with any gallery around the world as long as I think that it is worthy of me introducing that gallery and artist to a client. And so um while a lot of these things can be perceived as commodities and I wouldn't say commodities, but they are assets, right? Because they are unique and they have their own set of characteristics. I still love what I do. And it's um, it, it's a wonderful world, and but it has a lot of nuances. And the art market is uh, 300 billion globally or more. Um, it has seen an increase in the last three years, contrary to what everybody thought, the pandemic made the whole art world even more robust. But I think we should educate our our audience because the art world is not the guy who is outside the mat selling his things. The art world is not the tourist trap gallery in Vegas or Times Square. That that doesn't even count for the numbers I'm telling you. The art world is reputable galleries of which there are more than 1,000 in New York alone. That's what, one of the reasons why this city continues to be so important for the art world. There are auction houses, reputable and not reputable, but you know, I mean, big auction houses, medium-sized auction houses, and there are private dealers that do secondary market, which we all sort of do which is you know, bringing something that a client wants to sell to another client and making that happen. But a lot of those transactions are not recorded or reported. So when I talk about the 300 billion global industry, it's a figure that comes mostly from auction houses sales and also certain galleries that still report, not, not report, but are willing to communicate their sales to the people who put together this reports, which are usually very nicely put together by UBS and Art Basel annually. And there are other economists that also put things together for us to understand the size and nuances of the market. So I just want to make clear that the reason why people like me exist is because there is a clear difference between the, you know, tourist trap in Times Square and the gallery that sells things that get to earn an increase in value over time. I want to talk about some of the nuances of the art market in a moment. But before we do, you've acquired over $100 million for your clients of art of different art pieces and artwork. Tell me about some of your most memorable and maybe even some of your most expensive buys. Listen, sometimes the most expensive isn't necessarily the most memorable, but I think that I had a very incredible situation where I had a client in London and she called me and this was, a, it's a very important woman. And she said, my husband is, uh, is having his birthday in two months and I would love to gift him a Banksy, but it has to be from Banksy's studio. I'm not buying it from anybody else, you know? And so 
I was sweating and crying because literally this was like, um, maybe I was a year into my business. The business was new, but I already had clients because of word of mouth and people recommending me. And uh, uh, Banksy is anonymous. Seriously, I don't know who he is. And uh, I was like, well, how am I going to get to this, man? Because there is a website, but he is such a prankster. I don't even know if that website is real or anything. So I contacted a friend of mine who is a street artist in Brooklyn. And I said, look, I got this request. It's a very, very important collector. And I'd love to make this happen. And the artist said to me, well, you are in luck, darling, because I am uh, I know Banksy and I'm very good friends with a studio manager in London. So I am going to make an intro by email. So that happened. And from there, it was like an FBI operation. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> uh, seriously. So it was like code names and code numbers. And uh, the woman who is the studio manager is like, tell your client that she's got to meet me on the corner of this market in London. And I'm going to be wearing this and she is because they didn't really want to disclose the exact location of the studio. And I was like, gosh, I just hope she doesn't ask me to blindfold the client or something. You know, because, <laughs> because I was in New York. The client was in London. The thing was happening in London. So I was really up like at three in the morning because it was eight in the morning. I mean, it was just memorable. The bottom line is my client never get, got to see Banksy because he obviously wasn't going to be there, but my client got the painting. It's extraordinarily beautiful. It was the right price. Uh, and the husband was very happy. And it was really something memorable for me because I was so new in the business. And second, because of the particularity surrounding this sale and how things happen. So that is something that I will never forget. And uh, I, it's a story, you know, for me to tell the future because Banksy continues to be a very, very well-known. And, and he will um, be written in our history books. Uh, even though I'm not a huge fan of street art anymore, I like I feel like I've, I've outgrown those things. I love what he does and the way he does it. And he continues to make fun of all of us. And uh <laughs> In, including when he destroyed his own painting and uh, at at, a, at an auction, and it actually what it, he did is like increase the price four times. When with that act alone, what he did is that he made that painting extremely valuable. So that's as one you, of my most interesting and fun adventures. As you talk about Banksy, it really makes me think about the art market in general. Why look at art as an investment? Like, why look at it in that manner versus just kind of the enjoyment of having it and having it on your walls? Well, it's both things, right? Uh, if you can make money out of something that it enhances your life, it brings a piece of culture, it brings knowledge and education and a conversation piece, and it checks so many boxes and if you are in the business of reselling things for a profit and you know what you're doing because there are a lot of variables here right this is not like going and opening an e-trade account and buying apple it is not like that but it is a very fascinating market it is a full-time job this is what i try to explain people it is if you were to be something that you or Joe or Dick or Harry could do, they could, but you've got to dedicate at least eight hours a day every day to understand what's going on, right? So to answer the question on the practical standpoint, besides having something that enhances your life, if you do know what you're buying, usually art exceeds the returns of the S&P 500 by at least five to 6% every year and this has been also analyzed by economists it has been analyzed by people and mathematicians and people who do those things i don't do those things i, I receive the reports and i compare with a lot of different other reports right so especially during infl inflationary times because you've seen the stock market and you've seen how the volatility in the stock market but 
having a piece of art that is special, that is important and that is unique is a very rare commodity to in the market. So when you have, when you're holding onto an asset that is special, important, that has quality, that has a history, et cetera, is, is yours and only yours. And somebody else is probably looking for that too. Right. And remember, we're part of a global market. It's not just the United States, but we have a very active and hungry Asian market that wants to buy more and more Western artists. So they are constantly looking for what we find here that is hot. Equally, they are very into buying Picasso and they are very much into buying, uh, you know, artists from uh, the abstract expressionist of the 50s in New York, you know, Jackson Pollock and Joan Mitchell. And yes, these are in the hundreds of millions of dollars. It doesn't have to be for everybody. But what I'm saying is that the market became a global thing that is not just Americans and it's not just Europeans. So the number one place where the most transactions occur is New York. And the number, the second place is London. And the third place is Hong Kong. And Hong Kong and London are very, very close in um, getting at the same level um, of transactions. And the majority of collectors still live in the United States because Asia also, you know, with different regimes and like how the distribution of money exists, right? I mean, it's like they're new to money in a way. We've had money for a while. So because of that, we still have the majority of collectors here. But just to go back to your question, why is this an important vehicle for diversification is because it's a place to put your money where you still can have it, have it on your walls. You still can enjoy it. And if you know what you're doing, you can really get an enormous return. And that is, when I when I talk about a 13% return, um, I'm talking about a portfolio because when talking about individual artworks, the return can be 40, 50% annualized, right? A great Banksy, like a really good one, something that you had to pay money for it, can get a rate of return of 40% annually. It can and but it ha it can't be a print that you bought on Times Square. No, it's not that. But let's talk about that then, because I mean, you've talked about Banksy, you've talked about mm -hmm. Picasso, um, you've mentioned Pollock. I mean, this sounds like something wealthy people do. Yeah. What about the rest of us? What about people who don't have the millions to put into a Banksy or a Picasso? Then you then you have to play the game of emerging. And you have to wait a little bit because emerging artists are also extremely hot. I can tell you an example of an artist who, she was born in 1992. So I don't know, do the math, how old is she? This is because my clients tell me this is a lot of money for someone who's 31, been born in 1992. Yeah. Right. So, so she's 31. She lives in London um, and people fell in love with her work. She's a very educated, uh, she's she's a very educated artist and she uh, she went to great schools and whatever. And she started working with get galleries from the get go. She's an abstract artist and people fell in love with her work and it became a hot commodity and museums started like asking and acquiring and things like that. And now like, you know, she's with the biggest gallery in the, actually in the world, not the United States, it's, it's Gagosian. And she's, her work is, mm, Five hundred thousand dollars, with if you can get one, because they also are not really selling them to anybody. Um, and those paintings, like two years ago, were not two, but three years ago, maybe were like thirty-five thousand, right? I mean, um, and I don't know, five years ago they were twelve thousand. And so, what I'm saying is that is it happening with every artist? No. But do we handle a lot of info in my business of who's buying what and why and what? And so we also take bets. That's the other thing, right? I mean, this is highly discretionary and is highly speculative. I mean, it's not for the faint of heart either, right? I mean, um, I have clients who come and say, I, I mean, yeah, people who come and say, I have $20,000 to spend every year, you know? What can we do? Not a lot, but we can. And uh, maybe three things of, uh, you know, 7,500 or whatever. And, you know, 
I think it's possible to see that money grow. I think that there are certain indicators. Who is the gallery that is showing this artist is one of the most important things I look at because it tells me that there is somebody backing that artist up that has already skin in the game. I want to remind you that uh, rents in New York City for galleries, for example, could be $80,000 a month. So nobody really wants to be hanging out or with people who do not have commitment or potentials and capacities to see this come through, right? In like, in in on the other side. Um, I also see who else is collecting. If I can read more about the artist's I will, obviously, I always do. Like, what is the statement? What is this person believing? It, besides being aesthetically wonderful, because a lot of these young artists have had an enormous amount of visual education through Instagram. Just remember, this thing did not exist, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 10, 11 years ago. So they don't have to be anywhere. They can just be scrolling, right? And just, just like everything gets to be reinvented and rearranged in their brains and in their canvases in wonderful ways. So they are really skilled. And, you know, um, if like you said, the rest of us, I mean, and I include myself in the rest of us is that we take bets uh, and we tell, we take our bets knowing that personally, and I am going to be very clear, I'd rather spend 20,000 bucks on great artists than put, having put that shit on FTX, for example, you know, or like crypto or any of that shit that, you know, it went to zero and people didn't even have the pleasure of having the art and the cultural exchange and, you know, the walls covered with something amazing and you wait, you know, if like it might not necessarily, because that's the other thing, right? I mean, a lot of the galleries don't want you to flip their work when it becomes expensive. They want you to hold it. And they want you to sometimes even sign agreements with galleries that says that if you want to sell it, you have to sell it back to them, hmm. which is fair. They will pay the price at the current, you know, price once you decide that you don't want it anymore. If they're, If the artist is incredibly hot, obviously, right? They will always want to write a first refusal, but those are nuances. It doesn't happen with every gallery, but you have to sort of respect that thing. If it's a secondary market work that came from another collector and you just think it's a great opportunity and you just want to sell it the same next day at Phillips or at Sotheby's, you know, you don't hold any sort of uh, contractual obligation with anybody. And the truth is those are ethical agreements because it's unenforceable from a standpoint of preventing someone from selling. It's just that you don't want to be blacklisted forever in a gallery if they tell you, please don't sell this. Tell us first, we will buy it or we will find a buyer or, you know, so those it's like you've got to play ethics. That's it. And that's an important thing. If you if you if anybody considers getting into the art world as a collector and buying on their own, they should respect whatever terms galleries impose onto them. I, I want to get back to this conversation about this idea like crypto or FDX. You put your money in that and you're right. It can go to zero. It's highly speculative. Yet when we're talking about people who don't have the millions, right, we're talking about our average everyday Joe and Janes. Um, in a sense, you're looking at emerging markets, you're looking at maybe the artwork that's not as expensive. And in a sense, that can also be fairly speculative, right? So we're talking about the returns. Absolutely. Yeah. We're talking about like the returns compared to S&P 500 index. But a lot of times what we're really talking about is the more expensive and established artists. When you go to the more emergent or speculative market, my question is not whether it can you know, have great returns or not, but how does your hobbyist, your person who isn't a professional, maybe who doesn't have as much money, how do they make their way through that market and, and, and even figure out like what is quality and what isn't? Education. And that's what I am telling you. I exist because I, this is what I do every day and every night. And education means go to every gallery that you can go to every art fair that you can most things are really on websites and you don't really have to physically go, but it will be great if you do so that you see in person what is crap and what is not, right? But maybe to the layman, day one, it will all look the same. 
but after a certain amount of time. And so that's what I'm saying, education. And education is something that people decide. You decide to put in the time and you, the same way that so many people have learned how to invest in the stock market, right? Because again, it doesn't matter if I go tomorrow and I open an E-Trade account, I may be like, you know, wipe out clean the next day because I didn't really know what I was doing, right? So this is no different, except that there is uniqueness and there and, and it's not, the information is not readily available. You don't know who is, for example, unless it is written in the press, who's the collector who's buying this artist? Is this artist potentially going to be acquired by a museum anytime soon? And this happens with young folks. Again, it just... Like I said before, it's not just for the ultra wealthy, but for the people who do want to diversify, there are options, but you've got to be paying attention and reading and going on websites and, you know, reading art news. That is the, what we read is our trade and it's, you know, free. And uh, it has all the up-to-date things of the art market. Of course, it doesn't have everything because it's limited and uh, you know it only has a certain amount of articles that come out every day. But there are art fairs happening in this state everywhere, on every coast. Not every city, but you know, the, there is uh, the Dallas Art Fair. There is uh, There are like seven or 10 art fairs in New York City of importance. Right now there are fairs in Los Angeles, right the second happening. Um, there are art fairs I'm obviously Art Basel in Miami in December. And so um, no matter the corner you are, you can actually access these things and start paying attention and seeing things. And perhaps you're not going to make a purchase, you know, in the first six months, you're just educating yourself. You're reading everything you can. You're forming also criteria of the things that, well, you know, I could have this in like hanging on my walls. And even if it's, I'm not selling it immediately, it will still be pleasant and I would love to live with it, right? And uh, in all things considered, let's say I spent $5,000 on a medium-sized canvas that I love. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to have that. And some some uh, collectors who have amassed important collections through other lives started like that. They are like, okay, I just can't buy two things a year and I'm going to put them on my wall. And that, but again, the commitment has to come from you to want to learn and be present to what you're doing. And I think that the argument goes the same for absolutely anything in life that you would want to be uh, investing on. That's, I mean, I'm sorry for people who lost the money on FDX is terrible, but I th don't think anybody did the due diligence to know how this business was operating from the back. Right. So just saying. We are talking to Maria Brito. She is an award-winning New York-based contemporary art advisor, entrepreneur, author, and curator. She has 13 years of experience as an art advisor after leaving her career as a corporate attorney in a big law firm in New York City. We're going to take a short break. I'm Doc G, and this is the Earn and Invest podcast. All right. Any questions before I ever read us back in? No. How do you feel? You happy? Good. Yes. Yes. How, for sure. You happy with the way we're going? Yes. Yes. And um, like... I love it because you you give real answers. Like, you know, sometimes you ask well, questions I mean, and people are like, like, yes or no. Like you give a nice full answer. No, I, I mean, good. I just I want to I, I want to make sure that I am clarifying the message. And but it's just the same, as I said before. I mean, like you would have a crypto expert sitting down here five months ago or whatever. And they say, yeah, put all your money in yeah. crypto. People run and do it, you know, so fuck that shit. I mean, I'm just telling yeah. them what I think well, and what I'm good at, you yeah. know, there there is. I don't think we need to go into it on this podcast episode, but there is the other side of the argument, which is so the the issue in this case I think, is for people who don't have as much money, there really is that kind of speculative nature. Yes, you shouldn't Absolutely, put your money in yeah. FTX or crypto, but you could put your money in S&P 500 index and do fairly well. Yes, you're not. Absolutely. And, and you're totally right. And, and, I, and I'm that's not, not take speculation. Away from that. Right. That's not speculation. No, but it's and like that it... doesn't take a huge amount of education. But there's some downsides, no. right? So the returns are not necessarily as good. Um, recessions and what's coming up in the next 10 years where we think the stock market is going to do crappy people, all, everyone, including even kind of some of the, the investors Biggest lower investors, down the totem yeah. pole 
but also the ones lower down the totem pole are saying, how am I going to match returns of the last decade and this next decade in which, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I want to get this back on the record. So I'm going to read us back in and then we will go at it. But I don't want to get into that argument here because my goal is not, what I want to do is expose people to what you're telling them, not necessarily yeah. argue the finer points. I think you can go back yeah. and forth on a lot of it. So, all right, let me go ahead and read us back in on three, two, one. Let me reintroduce you. We are talking to Maria Brito. She forgot what I wanted to say here. <laughs> three, two, one. Let me reintroduce you. We're talking to Marita Brito. She was selected by Complex Magazine as one of the 20 power players in the art world. And in 2020, she was named by Art News as one of the visionaries who gets to shape the art world. We are talking about art as an investment. Let's talk about the pandemic. You mentioned earlier this idea that you were surprised, frankly, that art actually continued to hold its value and even do better during the pandemic. Does art appear to be recession proof? Yes. Uh, in many cases, yes. And why I gave you the qualifier in many cases, it's because we are coming from three years of bonanza that has never been seen in the history of the art market. And I'm talking about 600 years of recorded history. And the, the slowdown that may occur in 2023, it is still fantastic compared to what it could have been, let's say, in 2008, after the bailouts and the collapses of Lehman and the Bernie made of, uh, you know, disaster and whatnot. And so it's a much more robust and resilient market for many reasons. One is because there are many more people with money everywhere than that it used to be in 2008, for example. I'm just making that comparison because it's a period of time that we can actually look back and understand. I don't wanna go back to the Great Depression. I don't wanna go back to you know, the Black Death in 1400. That's not helping us to actually analyze things. But the, the second thing why art market is somewhat recession-proof is because, as I said, earlier, it's a global market. So when a place is not doing that great, another place is doing a little better, right? So might not be that the world right now is uh, on a roll, but there are economies that are stronger. So you have certain economies that may do wonderfully well in Europe, just saying it's not the case, but or in Asia and the US may be struggling and having higher interest rates and things like that and then you have so it's a balance of things and that's important we have a very global market buying and the bigger that market becomes the stronger the whole market is right so what i think this year is for the whomever is in curious is the 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 it's a year of deals and so a lot of people are willing to negotiate their prices down, which is something that for the past three years was not necessary because the liquidity and the cash and everything was so easy. Also, a lot of crypto people got tired of NFTs and before their shrinkage, if you will, they came with the dollars and they said, I don't want an NFT anymore. I want to have something on my walls. So for better or worse, that was a very kind of easy money when you find someone who's 18 and have been holding crypto for 10 years, they are 28 and suddenly they have 10 million bucks in their bank account that they barely had to work for it. It doesn't matter. I don't care where the money comes from. Um, you know, I'm equally happy to take it to help you, right? So what I'm trying to say is that there were periods that were very interesting that we saw and that in increase the capacity of people to acquire things. And again, like this year is the year of the deals because a lot of people are willing to negotiate because auction houses are always happy to take your thing. Auction houses are an incredibly curious business because they charge fees from the buyer and from the seller and everybody's happy to do so, right? So they don't necessarily represent anybody. They are taking money from both sides and they invent more and more occasions to sell more and more things. You don't have to have those ceremonious 
auctions in play the ones that you see the pictures in the Wall Street Journal that is only twice a year uh, auction houses have auctions every day that you can bid online and that's it and that is another form of education if people are interested in seeing the fluctuations of this market they can go and take register on Sotheby's or Christie's online and Phillips too and see what's available at all levels they have prints they have multiples they have collections that are geared for people who just like you know landscapes or sceneries of seascapes everything and so that actually you can see from the comfort of your phone or your computer what is happening in the auction world and uh, that's obviously secondary market things that have been proven somewhat because they do take almost everything not everything but almost everything and um their ideal scenario is to sell it for a price where they can really make those two fees you know and and make a profit out of it so um yeah i would say it's recession proof but if you are like we we've been talking about highly speculative right and things like that so if i would not recommend anybody who has just a very limited amount of money to go and buy art I don't think that's the, the type of person who should do this. I think if you have discretionary budget and you have extra and you don't mind if the thing gets parked on your wall for a certain amount of time, then you should definitely look at diversifying through art. Um, it is a complex business. It is a complex market. Not everything by the same artist has the same value either, right? Because the Guernica at the Museo Reina Sofia in Madrid by Picasso, it's not the same value as a Picasso scribble on a piece of a notebook, right? So, you know, it's just making sure people understand that too, that it's not the same, even if it comes from the same artist. So things have relative values and levels of importance. But again, if somebody wants to get into this, I personally find it much more fun and fascinating than crypto and uh, or, you know, even the stock market. I mean, I think the stock market is wonderful, but I don't find it as fun and fascinating. And uh, I wouldn't really read prospectuses the same way I read an art history book. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little more about the difference between paper assets, right? Stocks and mm -hmm. bonds and artwork. Tactically and logistically, with artwork, there's some other concerns, right? You've got to secure it. You've got to take care of it. And then at some point, you might have to think of selling it. How are those things different? Like, is that something we have to spend a lot of time, money, or energy doing those things? Well, there are associated costs, right? You have to ship it to yourself, right? From anywhere you buy it, unless you go with a truck and pick it up yourself. I don't know. This might not be impractical if you bought something in London and you live in New York, right? I mean, it's not happening. Uh, you have to insure it. A lot of homeowners insurances just have a little add-on policy. So if you have already insured your house, you can always call your insurance company and say, I am buying this art. And could we introduce this to our policy? And usually it's not that amount, not, not a great amount of money. And then, you know, it's the space that you keep on your walls and you have to keep it safe, obviously. You are not going to put it on there, the shower. Right? I mean, like it's like, I think it's logical. Like, no, I'm, I'm serious. It's like, we're talking about logical things. You're not going to put it in front of the window where all the light comes in and eats it up, right? I mean, there are certain precautions that like, you know, any human being with a certain amount of common sense would be able to follow. So it is definitely, it has associated costs. It's not just like having, well, I, you know, if you have a stock, you also have to pay a fee. Nobody just can go and just trade stock. I mean, otherwise, you know, there's a lot of people making money here and the banks are making money and the trading systems are making money. And, you know, so there are associated costs for sure. And uh, people have to be aware of that and know that beforehand. Um, there is sales taxes in every state except Delaware, Montana and New Hampshire, if you want to know that. So sales taxes are there for you, baby, everywhere. And uh, but there are a lot of other things that are wonderful about it. You know, if you do have certain artworks that are valuable, 
and you would want to have a tax deduction, you can donate them to a museum after a certain, um, a, you, you need to hire a certified appraiser and you obviously need to want the museum. The museum has to want to get it and they have to give you a bunch of papers too. And that is the full amount is deductible from your income tax. So that's great. And I get it, that's not for everybody. But if you can't sell something, let's say, for whatever reason, you could potentially be able to get a write-off from your from your tax bill. But it's again that it's it has to be a it has it's not that it has to be the most important thing, but it has to be something that a museum wants. Clearly, when we're talking about this, you're talking from the place of someone who loves the artwork as well as sees that this is a wonderful investment. There are probably some people out there who don't love the artwork, but still see it as an investment. And maybe they don't want to deal with the hassles. Something that's happened pretty much in lots of fields, um, but we're starting to see an artwork too, is securitization, right? This idea yes. that people are buying artwork and they're selling shares or fractions of it mm -hmm. to a bunch of different people. They're holding it for them. Eventually they will sell it and then pay dividends or, or mm -hmm. and pay out. What do you think about securitization? Is it a good way to be into the art market? It's a different model. It's um, I am uh, friends and close to the people at Masterworks in New York. And it's a, I love them actually. It's a very, very smart people. But it's different. It is catered towards millennials and Gen Z and people who are commitment phobe in a way. You know that I don't want. <laughs> I don't want to have like you know this. This our beloved millennials who can't even own a house because God forbid, right? Like they have to have something. Um, but it's uh, it is very interesting. And masterworks, what they do is that each one of the paintings, they they don't buy sculptures they buy paintings and um each one of the paintings is fractionalized and each one of the paintings has its own levels of different returns depending on the market and you can buy depending on the offerings at any given time you can buy their own your own you can buy two shares right or whatever it is in one painting and two shares on another and two shares on another so you can form a portfolio of things that you like uh, you will never have possession of that artwork. It'll never hang on your living room or anything, but you can look at it on like a screen or, you know, you can show it to people on your phone and say, I own two shares of this Picasso, you know, and that's great. I don't have anything against it. It's just a very different type of model. If you understand that, you know, also they do have their expenses like any other business that is, it's a for-profit business, right? Like they have their own expenses that don't you ever think that just like all the profit is yours, right? I mean, it's not. So um, they do a good job though. I, I, I love Masterworks, the way they do things. It's not my thing, but I source sometimes things for them that they would want to get from my clients or, or from people I deal with that they want to buy for their own securitization so that's one thing and the other model uh it's more private and it's like funds where people buy a participation on the fund and not on a specific artwork so this is a whole lot looser because masterworks is regulated by the sec in a different way all funds are regulated by the sec in the united states at least but um the way that these other private funds work is that uh, they de designate a manager uh, who is an acquisitions specialist, and that person acquires certain amount of works over a period of time of, let's say, three to five years. Usually, it's three at most, honestly. And then that you also have three to five years to sell it, and then you participate off the whole. So it's a weighted average of all, all the things that have been in that, and and I, it's different, right? I mean, it's it all depends on the who you what you want i mean it's not easy to participate on the funds the funds will always require at least a hundred thousand dollars for anybody to, to come in and uh and masterworks again you can just go buy two shares and maybe those two shares are 200 dollars. i don't know because i don't really buy the fractionalized shares i am on the other side of the deal which is trying to sell them things that they want or sometimes when they are selling because you know their selling period is from three to five years 
Uh, so yeah, that's uh, nothing wrong with that. I think that people who have bought shares and fractionalized models the way this is are very happy with their return. I think, um, but again, it, you have to understand, like we have been saying, it's highly speculative. It, I mean, this conversation is the same thing. It's like, if I were to be telling you that Apple goes up and up only, you're not, I'm, first, I'm lying. And second, you're not really in this world, right? I mean, like, it's not true. So, past, you know, the, the past performance does not guarantee future returns. It's the truth. So, I... I, you know, I want people to understand that this is an alternative and that's why banks and hedge funds and whatever have alternatives. This is an alternative. This is not necessarily as liquid either, right? I mean, we've talked about selling already. So it's not the same thing as like, okay, I don't really want to hold on to Amazon anymore. I'm selling this. Here you go. I'm taking this money and I'm buying something else. It's not the same but it is an alternative. And I just want to make sure that I repeat this. If you have no money, don't get into this. It's not for you. And, you know, you again, Doc, you don't have to have a million bucks. You don't. You don't have to spend a million. You don't have to have that kind of money. But if you are trying to make a quick buck, which I hope everybody understands, that does not exist. I hope people have learned their lesson with what has happened with FTX. That if it is too good to be true, folks, it probably is. That doesn't mean I am a doomsday person, not at all. I'm super positive. And I think that there are many ways and wonderful ways to make money. But if it's just like, listen, insane returns quickly, here it is. I think that don't let anybody take away from your logical sense that this is normally not what happens, right? I mean, that's that make, that investing on any asset has inherent risks and that like the art world, if you want to do it for fun again and set up your own budget that you are like, I have this money and I'm going to go to art fairs and I'm going to have fun and I'm going to do it and uh, let's see where that takes me. And I'm going to be a curious person. and I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Please, if you're going to have fun, do it. But if you are like, no, I just like I could like, I, I don't know. I'm going to do this expecting that you're going to get me a return back. Then no, don't because it it just. It doesn't have that kind of dynamic. It could, but it's not necessarily the way that it operates at all times. So if we are interested in this world, what do you think is going to be hot in 2023? Um, you called this the the year of the deals, huh? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, look, uh, I think that because people bought so many things in the past three, we're going to see a lot of those things back in the market. People still are looking for quality and quality might mean the blue chip uh, that we talked about, Warhol, Picasso, those things that are very expensive. There is also a desire for, there is a resurgence also of the mid-career artist. The mid-career artist is that who started hot, had a moment, did really well for a certain period of time. And for whatever reasons, it could be the gallery closed. It could be, you know, the, the career stalled a little bit. All sorts of things happen, right? And the artists disappear for like, say, five years or whatever. And it's not that the person died or anything. It's just that the market wasn't paying attention. So I have seen a few resurgences of mid-career artists. These are people whose work works are still within a certain price range that is not insanely expensive. It's not super cheap either, but it has this quality of someone who's mature enough to back the work off with a long trajectory. And these people may be having museum shows. That museum show always increases the value of a painting and, and the value of the artist themselves, right? So I think we're going to see a lot of that. I think that there is potentially going to be a little bit of a contraction in all these super young crazy superstars going from, you know, what I told you, 10,000 to 500,000, maybe there's going to be a little bit of a, a slow down there. And hot, you know, artists, 
black artists have been very hot for the past 10 years, right? Because, or five, because for a long time, they were not necessarily taking into consideration the same way that someone who is white, unfortunately. But these artists are incredibly skilled. They have great education as well. And they have things to talk about and say that are important for history and that should be taken into consideration. Things that are part of the history of the United States, past and present, and they will continue to be important topics. Um, but there is room for everybody. I don't want to say that it's just Black. No, I, I say that for a long time it took, it was like giving birth for these artists to actually be taken seriously and work with big galleries and whatnot. It's not that they haven't done that. It's just that obviously the percentage was so small in comparison to all the other white artists. And so now we see that number being a little bit more equal. So we see a little more super skilled, super talented Black artists sharing equal footing with this white artist in the space of the galleries and the space of the um, auction houses and secondary market and museum shows and all those things. So that's a, that will continue to be, but it will be equalized. It's not going to be a pendulum that will go super strong because it was a super strong pendulum going to all the Black artists in the past five years. And now it's, it's like a little bit more stable where we can see the quality uh, off of diverse nation, right? I mean, at the end of the day that we, and I always, I mean, I talk about the United States, even though this is a global market and we have a lot of European artists who are doing wonderful and even African artists, not African-American, but African artists who are doing wonderful things out of Ghana and Nigeria and what those artists are also playing right now in an international market, which before, I don't know, before 2020, it was kind of unusual. And so it's like, new territories, new collectors, new artists, new places to discover, new places to take a look. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing for anybody who would want to at least do some sort of due diligence to learn something new, to start getting their feet wet by, by doing what I said, go check the auctions that are happening daily online. You don't have to wait until the big things. You have to just take a look at things, how much money people are paying for them, how much money, uh, how high or low they hit the the ones they have been you know, acquired, right? Because there is an estimate and so there is a high and a low. So go and see, take a look at things for people who are data nerds. You can actually have your own uh, spreadsheet and like mark the artists you like and have and look at I mean this is applicable to anybody who does the same thing with normal day-to-day -day markets so I I think that there is a lot of uh, possibility for people to have fun and to get a lot of education for free out of their comfort of their homes, reading the art net news and seeing what's happening in the art market and learn a little bit more before committing to doing anything. Well, Maria, I wanted to thank you for coming on the show. As we round out this conversation, what I really take from it is this idea that if you are interested in alternative investments and you want to look at artwork, you have an asset which generally tends to appreciate as a whole, above the S&P 500 index, also generally tends to do fairly well in recessions as it did in this pandemic. And last but not least, you also can acquire this artwork that you might just love that may sit in your home and you may admire it for decades and it may really add to your life. So not only an investment, but also a passion. I wanted to end this episode the way and every episode by asking you what is up next with your life. And specifically, if people want to reach out to you, learn more or work with you, how can they do that? Well, you know, I'm always busy. So as I said, the, the year of the deal has gotten me busy finding buyers for some of my clients' uh, artworks that they are selling right now. And um, people can find me at mariabrito.com. That's B as in boy, R as in rose, I as in island, T as in Tom O, mariabrito.com. So there is a form. If they want to fill it out, I'm more than happy 
to get back to you. And I'm, you know, busy working. I'm in New York. I'm traveling. I'm going to Spain soon for art fairs and more uh, acquisitions for clients. And, you know, it's just uh, the never ending grind. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I wanted to thank Maria Brito. That's a wrap. Awesome. I keep things running just for a few seconds as I record the after show, just whatever we talk about. Um, yeah, thanks for doing this. I, I've obviously always been fascinated by the art market um, just because of my early experiences buying and selling it, as well as this idea, which you and I talked about, which is, you know, wealthy people, wealthy endowments, institutions that have a lot of money almost all have at least some of their assets and artwork. Like you see this everywhere. And the truth of the matter is the data, I mean, I've, I've had Scott Lynn on the show before. And so we've talked about the data about how the art market does and how its returns are. And there are some very robust returns, especially with the blue chip art market. Um, so I can see where some people would be really interested if you are into alternative assets. And it's a really kind of I'm not a big fan of collectibles in general because I think it is so speculative I'm up and yeah. down, but but the art market has really proved itself. Again, especially when you're going with established art. I think with emerging art, right, you can get much higher returns, but it's just, again- It's a that, bet. It, it is. It really becomes much more speculative there. Um, yeah, so I find it interesting and fun. You know, I think it's it's something that that people who are passionate about it really can get into it as well as make some money. I think the securitization thing is also interesting just because I feel like those of us, I shouldn't say those of us, the people out there who have no interest in art, I still like this idea that they might be able to get into some of the returns without having the passion. Yeah, I think that the that's the point uh, for how they run that business is to get people... Like, okay, you don't want to buy anything. You can still have a piece of this. And yeah. they have done pretty well, actually. And uh, I must say that do, they do v very aggressive tactics of, uh, you know, recruiting their people uh, through Instagram and Facebook ads. Yeah. And yeah, uh, they have an yeah. entire uh, telemarketing uh, center. I've been to their offices in New York. And it really, yeah. they employ a lot of people. It's very intense. But... Look, that might be the future of certain things for certain groups of people, right? I mean, like most majority of people at some point that that have done things like that, like I told you that the crypto people who invested on NFTs to a certain degree, they sort of grew up and say, I don't really need to have a monkey on a screen. I can yeah. have something on my walls, right? It's such a big difference. The digital rights, I never understood it. And I know some people really were big on it, but I mean- after having artwork in my house, you either have it in your house or you don't really have it. Having it on well, your screen doesn't, I think, I think people doesn't like do to play. as much for you. I know. I think people like to play. I um, I think my, many people with decent money have felt very intimidating by very intimidated by the art world for a long time. So they had access to NFTs without having to do much other than having the wallet and the money. And so that was an easy thing for them to play with and to say almost like baseball cards, right? I have this, what yeah. do you have? And things like that. So it is, um, you know, I, I love to have this conversation with you because obviously you and I have very, very different perspectives of how we're looking at this yeah. and why I'm super bullish about it and have always been because I've, look, I've been in this business third, I mean, almost 14 and all I see is up and up always, but not, but the, it's tricky because it could be that you buy something from an artist that is doing wonderfully well and suddenly is not. And that is, and that has so many reasons, right? But it could be the artist changed the style, nobody liked it, or the yeah. artist never changed the style and it was too boring. It could be uh, the artist made weird moves and went and signed with a different gallery that they didn't care about that artist anymore. So when you're dealing with things that are, you know, the intangibles of a life, then, yeah. um, you know, Here's the problem for me, and I think this is the problem that your typical stock investors, especially index investors, face. There is no question that the returns long-term 
are very strong for very expensive blue chip art. And all of us were big fans of diversification. So if you want to diversify on very expensive blue chip art, you're really talking about having a lot of money to put into it, right? But if you have that money and you can have a diversified portfolio of blue chip art, you are going to have fantastic returns. But that's a very small percentage of larger, wealthier institutions, et cetera. For the the requisite is having the money, right? right? So so the rest of us, Yep. have to go for the more emerging markets, yeah. which moves us really from tried and true, what we look at as investment to way more speculation, which means you may hit it big, you might get it right, or you might use someone smart like you who can help you Navigate by, it. Yeah. by far increase your odds of doing well. But people who kind of come from this more measured investing philosophy don't like speculation. They really I like agree. this idea Listen. of investment. But but again, so what you're looking at is measured returns over a long period of times. So you're not going to hit out of the park, but you're going to do well. You can do better with art again if you have the if you have enough wealth to really say, okay, I'm going to put 10, 20 million dollars into this, buy some really nice blue chip art, maybe diversify a little bit. You're going to do very well. I think this should be other- like a, I don't know if it's even that number. I mean, I have a client who's worked with me for 10 years. He spent two million and now those two turn into six because yeah. of me. So what I'm saying is, but it, this wasn't the span of two of two years. I mean, yeah. and this is a man who actually he was C suite in a is it's actually uh an SP 500 company that trades mm-hmm. bonds and electronic exchange. And that man is like he's he says he's gonna be my client forever because he's never seen returns on anything like this, but he loves it. It's on his walls. And it's like, he's not selling it. He's like, this is for my kids. And maybe when the kids get it, it's worth nothing. You don't know. Right. I mean like that, not nothing, but what I'm trying to say is that because it's highly speculative and the, the value as of today, those 2 million turn into six because of how this, whether we want to call it bubble frenzy, crazy or not grew so much, but it's not going to deflate to zero, basically. Yeah. It's just the way a uh, junk stock or crypto could. Crash. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. And none of these artists is giving up either. That's the other thing. Like, I mean, the, people can do strange things, but once they've tasted all this money and fame, they don't want to really go back to being like, you know, starving artists. Believe me, nobody wants to do <laughs> Nobody wants even, to do even that. Banksy? <laughs> not in, like, I mean, Banksy is such an incredible character because. Yeah, you know, he's just such like, a character. I love, did you say, right? I saw the, the documentary, right? Didn't he make his own movie about about himself pretty much he did it he did it with this other guy called terry yeah and, i uh, saw that yeah i watched the documentary a while back that was fun yeah yeah i mean it, it's just genius you know but this is at its own sub world and uh i, I mean it, i i love talking to you and it's fun and i hope that your audience gets a kick out of this thing because it's a very mm. very unique way and honestly i find it way law less less scary than buying real estate less is scary and uh you know barriers of entry are also way smaller you don't have to get a mortgage you don't have to pay a broke well you have to pay me if you are in the in the business of hiring yeah. someone in the middle but you know if you do decide to go on your own you can you don't have to pay a middleman and you don't have to um you know get all this recorded documents and hire lawyers and shit so i don't know I mean, that's just because it's my business that I see it in this way. I mean, obviously, everybody wants to have a house. You're not going to live on a painting, right? I mean, so, but for whomever invests in real estate as a side gig, I think art is a lot more. The other thing is your your painting is not going to spring a leak in the toilet and wake you up at three (laughs) in the morning to come fix it either. So I've I've owned real estate. I've owned artwork. Uh, Owning artwork is a lot easier and a lot more fun, but. (laughs) <laughs> well, I I certainly appreciate this combo. You're super fun and um you know, thank you. It's yeah. it's great to talk to you. Yeah, no, no, thank you for coming on and I will edit this up and I think I don't have as many in the stock as I had before. So this will probably come out within the next few weeks, but I'll send you a copy of it yes. before it does. 
Um, I'll, I, I'll definitely put it out. It's fine. That I have, I love having these kind of conversations on my podcast because they're not the typical conversations that people hear kind of in at least the straightforward personal. Yeah. Life. And that's what is fun. I mean that, you know, you give a people, you give people ideas of other things, yeah. even if they yeah. don't do it, at least they understand that the, the world of alternatives exist and it's, it's alive yeah. and it's alive and it's uh, kicking and it's doing well. And there are people like you who will help them. That's that's true. Have a great weekend. It was well, nice thank you so you. much, Doc. Have a great weekend. Take care. Take care. Nice meeting you too. Bye-bye. Bye.